Welcome back to From the Front Line, Surgeon's Voices for the American College Surgeon's Bulletin Brief to my friend, Dr. Paula Ferrata from the Young Fellows Association. Paula is the Director of Surgical Intensive Care Trauma at Virginia Commonwealth University. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Well, Dr. Ferrata, you always do a great job, whether it's at a Board of Regents meeting or with interviews or on the podium. I'm, I'm sure clearly also at work at your hospital at VCU. Could you start out telling us a little bit about the Quality and Safety Conference? You were both the interviewer and the interviewee in two separate fireside chats at Quality and Safety. I'm not sure everybody got to watch. They can, if they didn't, I think, still register and go online. But perhaps you could share your reflections on the quality and ease of use of those sessions. Well, I think it was, this was just a wonderful opportunity to uh, make use of our um, platforms uh, online. I think that the world is getting smaller and the um, uh, great opportunity of having these interviews for free and be able to talk to leaders in the college. Um, I have the chance to talk to Dr. Rush and interview her and ask her questions about mentoring and leadership and, um, and her path in her career. Um, and then Dr. Turner interviewed me about issues with young surgeons it's just it was really nice and um and you know lay back down to earth um a conversation and it's good to get the insight from different people and how they had a different path in their careers and the, in their advancement locally but also in the american college of surgeons was there the opportunity to have chat function during the fireside chats Right. We, um, uh, we, it was just between us. It was not, we didn't include it, um, uh, questions from the audience. I know that that's also a, uh, something that we can do during Zoom. And I think that, that we're going to use that for the American College of Surgeons for the big conference too, which is very exciting because um, now, well, first is for free. Second, you can do it from home and uh, you have the opportunity to just give your opinion and, um, and ask some questions and hear from the leadership of the college and experts in different fields. I think it's, I just think it, like from all the things that COVID brought up um, that are not good, this is one of the good things. Well, I, I definitely agree with you in that regard that it hastens everybody's education in, into virtual media and, and conferencing. As we've transitioned to discuss the annual clinical congress, you represent the Young Fellows Association on the program committee. Could you tell us about some aspects of the program, perhaps some sessions that will be particularly germane to young surgeons? So I think that, well, the program committee always works super hard during the entire year to produce a great conference. But this year, particularly, I think it has been amazing. The flexibility and, and be able to change what we had with uh, plenary sessions to now having those sessions in short periods of time or even having panel sessions, I think it's just, I think it's going to be great. I'm really excited for it. Some of the things or the majority of the things are going to be pre-recorded. Um, and I think that if there's, uh, some of them will have the opportunity to have uh, back and forth uh, questions from the audience, which I think is, um, is, is going to be a great feature. Um, for the young surgeons, we um, have been trying to get more sessions are um, uh, moderated or that include young surgeons. I think this year we had up to 19 sessions, which is excellent. Um, we are collaborating with the Women in Surgery Committee. We're collaborating with the General Surgery, with Ethics, with several committees and um, and some of the majority of them, I would think that any of these sessions, even if they don't have a sponsor as, as young surgeons, are friendly for young surgeons because they are um, experts opinion, they're case studies, they're, um, they're real patient scenarios. And even the plenaries, right now, I think that even those are even more friendly for learning because they're going to be shorter and they're going to um, just keep you on your toes and having more like a rapid fire learning and uh, high yield rather than sitting down in a conference. And you can do it from the comfort of your office. Thanks. That's a very important point. Can be done from office, can be done from home. In terms of timing, was there any consideration to content for young surgeons, uh, residents and associate members? putting it in the program at a time they might be more likely to participate in the initially launched live version? 
That's an interesting question. I don't uh, know that we have a better time or or not a better time to, to participate. I know that the sessions are going to be available for people to look at when they register. Um, not So it's not necessarily one time that you need to sit there and stay for a few hours sitting down. You can just, you know, see a couple in the morning, go do your cases or take care of whatever you have to take care of and then listen to a couple more in the afternoon. I think it's really friendly to every type of surgeon, but especially young surgeons, e residents and associate members, because we have, you know, you cannot, you don't have time to a block, a specific block of time to just sit down and learn. You can just like do it, pause it, do what you have to do and come back to it. The same advantage may apply to other groups who you also represent. For example, international surgeons, you're, you're very engaged uh, with, with surgery in, in the Spanish speaking world, Latin America, as well as globally. Do you anticipate that we're going to have more international attendance as a result of both price and the lack of necessity to travel? Absolutely. I think it's a huge advantage. I think, as I said before, the world is getting smaller. I think we have to embrace this opportunity. Uh, we have the chance of being able to talk to each other without having to pay uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel and hotel and all of that. I mean, I miss the fact that we're not going to you know, be able to just you know, uh, shake hands or give a hug, but we can't anyway. <laughs> now we've got it. I think, uh, I think that we, I think with us as an academic and scientific community, uh, the learning curve has been steep in terms of adjusting to our new reality. I also think that there are some things that COVID probably changed for good, not only for this um, uh, period of time. I think understanding the value of you know time, travel, and 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 understanding that we can communicate and ben benefit from each other not necessarily having to travel at hundreds of thousands of miles, but just, you know, by a Zoom call. One of the other many areas for which you're, you're known as being dynamic and innovative is social media. Do you think that the virtual platform will have any kind of impact, either increased use or decreased use of social media to discuss what is being taught in the different sessions? I think that they, um, I think that they basically amplify each other. I don't think, I mean, social media, you can put things in YouTube and you can link them to uh, Twitter. We have seen an increased uh, amount of activity in Twitter in terms of scientific content, discussing cases um, uh, or discussing issues with COVID or especially with COVID because there were some things that we could not wait for a randomized control trial, uh, but we needed to benefit from each other's experience. I think that, I don't think it's going to decrease. I think it's going to increase and I'm going to think they're going to complement each other and amplify each other uh, in terms of like enhancing discussion and, in, and, and amplifying the message. Thanks. And then lastly, in terms of your day job or perhaps night job in trauma, <laughs> can you highlight a couple of sessions for us uh, or orations that'll be particularly germane to surgeons who deal with trauma? I think that there's a lot of really cool things that the college has. Um, particularly, we're going to have these uh, panel saying, uh, talking about a, a night on call in the ICU, and we're going to discuss a couple of patients. We have several experts, and we're going to do it in a uh, panel uh, way, uh, having everybody giving their opinions in real time, which I think is really, really cool. Um, there's also the classic uh, uh, rapid fire hot topic. Topics. There's hot topics in uh, acute care surgery, but I think there's hot topics pretty much in every other aspect. And I think any surgeon, uh, trauma or non-trauma, can benefit from these ones. Um, I I do think that there's going to be an endless amount of resources. And I think the fact that it's not going to be just basically limit into a week, but that you can you can uh, have watch it at your own time, I think is going to be really useful for surgeons everywhere. Well, thanks again for taking your time to be with us today. Thanks for all you've done for the program committee. You used to do for RAS, now you do for YFA, uh, as well as disseminating the word on, on social media. Really appreciate everything you do all the time. Hope to see you in person 
at some point. Hopefully, not <laughs> well, hopefully I see you in person soon. For me, it's an honor. Thank you for the honor and the opportunity to serve. I think that uh, there's, we have done, uh, I think in general, the American College of Surgeons has done a tremendous job in bringing surgeons together in this time of need where we need guidance and we need um, leadership and we need information. And I, I'm just in awe in how well this has worked and I feel privileged to be part of it. Thank you.